hit play, so check this. this is a hard knock life, but not the chick of kind More like the people in the world seeking perspectives with a different life The kids who share the interest together with a similar kind When they said John Glover for Spider-Man, they didn't mind Welcome back to another episode of Hard Knock Life I'm your host, Keith Chow uh, We have a great episode lined up for you tonight We're talking to a couple of people who are responsible for uh, a movie that's coming out next year and, and we're looking forward to it. Nerds of Color, we've talked about it a few times. We have two people responsible for the film with us tonight. First up is uh, the composer of the film, Shoji Kameda from uh, Los Angeles. What's going on, Shoji? Great. Happy to be here. Welcome to Hard Knock Life. Yes. Hello, Nerds of Color. <laughs> uh, and the other person involved with the film is the writer, producer, director, uh, Grand Pooba of Yama Song. It's Mr. Sam Koji Hale, also from. Los Angeles. Welcome to Hard Knock Life, Sam. Hello, Keith, and hello, nerds. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming on, and, and I buried the lead a little bit. The movie is called Yamasang March of the Hollows, uh, but it's also a follow-up to a film called Yamasang that came out many, many years ago. Um, if you don't know, those of you who are watching or listening to this podcast, uh, Sam was responsible for a little, um, I think, like five or eight minute short film back in 2009, I believe, called Yamasong, yeah. and it basically tells the story. Of, uh, well, let me, I'll let you talk about it, uh, where, the, where, the, where the, sh the idea for the short film came from um, and, and kind of the origin story of Yamasong. Yeah, so Yamasong is a story about a uh, patchwork girl who's an automata and a tortoise warrior. And the girl basically falls through a pool of, of water, enchanted water, that takes her to this world she's been viewing from, uh, from afar for years. But the music for Yamasong started with uh, Shoji and his, his group, Own Ensemble. Uh, they were working on a new album called Ume in the Middle. And uh, Yamasong was the first track on that album. I know that one of the things that kind of stands out about it is it's this real driving percussive uh, soundtrack. And I know Shoji, uh, your your mm -hmm. group on Ensemble is a is kind of uh, rooted in a lot of uh, uh, Japanese sounds, particularly the taiko drum. Uh, can yeah. you talk a little bit about on Ensemble and how how your music kind of you know led to the the short film that Sam put together? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So my group on Ensemble, um, our primary instrument is the Japanese drum, the taiko. But um, but we really use you know it, it's it's the instrument that um, it it was um, the two leaders of the group are myself and a childhood friend um, named Maz and we've like grown up together and we've been playing taiko together from ages like basically six and eight so we've been making music for over thirty years together and um, and what we do. Like the taiko is is still our primary instrument. It's the instrument that we sort of grew up playing and loving, and it's the instrument that really got us into music. But um, but we we have a ton of 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 musical influences, and and uh, within all ensemble, we really just try to bring in all these different musical influences. Uh, some jazz, some electronica, a lot of world music um, comes in. A lot of world music influences, like. Uh, we do a lot of uh, throat singing or overtone singing that comes from uh, Central Asia, um, gamelan, and uh, and that sort of um, Southeast Asian um, sort of gong-based music that has recently been a, a point of interest of mine. Um, so you hear a lot of those sort of elements in there, and um, yeah, and and we just try to create this sort of really organic, um, unique world with our music and. Um, the way I met Sam is I had seen one of his um, underground puppet shows that he was doing in Los Angeles. It was a, a anti-war um, show. It, this was during the sort of dark, you know, Bush years. And, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and so it was like this sort of anti-war thing. And it, it was based around these sort of Japanese mythologies. And it was a really, really powerful show. And um, I remember meeting Sam at that. And then, we um, we met again at a different show, and um, I had passed him the album that we were working on, and it had all these tracks. And one thing in all ensembles, we always wanted to do some kind of like music video or you know put visuals to our our music, but we never we had a really hard time like finding the right thing. And 
the next day that after I had met Sam, he had uh, emailed me back. He had just like, there was just pages and pages of like story treatments and ideas, mm -hmm. um, you know, like two or three, like really solid fleshed out ideas for every single track. And there was like 10 tracks on the album. So, um, and when I was reading through them, I just, I was like, oh, I got to work with this guy. He totally gets it. Like a lot of the imagery um, that he was coming up with would, would be very connected to the things that I was thinking of when I was making the tracks. Um, and, uh, and, and that's kind of how it started. So the first, you know, the short film was very much, it was more of a, you know, like the music was, was um, sort of front and center and the, the visuals like told the story around the music. Um, and obviously, like, since that time, uh, Sam has really, like, expanded this world of Yamasan right. and it's brought in, it's like, it's become this much, much bigger thing. But uh, but that was the original, um, the original impetus. You know, I know that the music from Mono Ensemble kind of, you know, gave birth in the sense of the ideas that eventually became Yamasan, uh, the, the short film. But also, I think there's a lot of, anyone who's seen, who may have seen the short film or even seen the trailer for the for the new feature length film that's, that, that came out a few weeks ago. Um, that there's definitely a, a Japanese puppetry kind of influence to the to your style of puppetry. Can you talk a little bit about um, that influence and that style and how that kind of informs the, the puppetry of the films that you make? Yeah, yeah, I mean the style, the style that we're really, you know, influenced by is, is Japanese bunaku, which is traditional Japanese puppetry where you have three performers performing the puppet, you know, a performer performs the head and an arm, another performer performs the other arm, another performer performs the feet. Now, in, in traditional Japanese culture, you know, you work your way up those ranks. So you start as a feet puppeteer and you puppeteer for 10 years and you move to an arm puppeteer another 10 years and eventually move up to the head. Um, you know, we don't have that kind of structure, but, but the idea <laughs> You know, multiple puppeteers bringing one character to life is, is definitely what we're working with here. And then what we're bringing to it is kind of a modern side, which is, you know, we shoot on green screen and then composite the, you know, key the puppeteers out, rotoscope them out, whatever we need to. Mostly hide the puppeteers, but sometimes, you know, we've, when we just finished shooting some stuff last week, and you, when you get in a big fight scene, you've got like six people gathered around the puppet and you're trying to, trying to move puppeteer as far away from the puppet as possible but still get that that direct contact performance and and so um, it's uh, I'll, I'll show you the behind the scenes sometimes you'll, you'll be like what's going on Cause, <laughs> you know, like three people connected to each moving puppet and it's it's just kind of a, a interesting thing to see and then uh, then we bring in some other influences too you know I, I like shadow puppets so um, you know I'll, I'll try to bring you know use ways of using shadows you know it's not directly the like traditional um, Asian shadow puppetry where it's a, a hard silhouette, but, you know, we'll, we'll front light stuff and, you know, create a silhouette for uh, characters in the foreground. Or um, one, I, one thing I've done a couple times in the film is where a character enters a room and you see their shadow on the wall and there's a conversation with the shadow on the wall before you, you know, swing the camera around and actually see the character. So um, there's some shadow puppet influence and, uh, and some marionettes too. I mean, there are no pure marionettes, but... Um, there are times when a rod's too thick in camera, especially if it's a camera side arm and a rod crosses a body, it will string the wrist and, and pull the wrist out with the string instead. So we're kind of we're kind of mixing it up, but it's really, you know, the, the main inspiration is Japanese puppetry. Well, just, just hearing you kind of talk about all the different various forms of puppetry, one of the things that, you know, stands out in your work is that is you're, you have a definite passion for that for the art form so can we talk a little bit about you know were you always the what what kind of uh, got you into the world of, of puppet puppets and, and and wanting to make films about uh, using puppets as, as your as your main source of, uh, of uh, I guess your, your main actors yeah yeah uh, you know it's funny when I when I lived in Japan I, I didn't really explore it I was there for three years and I remember seeing one or two Bunnaku shows I even met some performers, but I remember, I don't remember really jumping in there going, hey, teach me this. I want to know this. I've, I've learned a lot from a lot of puppeteers here, and, and uh, what happened was uh, I was in art school and studying to be an illustrator, fine artist, and I was working on my master show, and um, it was a, a series of illustrations. I just didn't feel like it was comprehensive, that the illustrations didn't tell the whole story that I was trying to tell for that show. So one of my mentors said, why don't you do a puppet show? And um, so I got online and looked around and found the San Francisco Bay Area Puppeteers Guild. Went to their first meet, their, my first meeting with this guild, and uh, Dave Goles was there. And Dave Goles is a puppeteer. Puppeteers gone, so the great. 
and he had Gonzo. So Dave wow. was there with Gonzo and did a and a with the audience and interacted with people. It was really cool. And I was like, wow, this is this is neat. I'm, I'm going to start, you know, studying puppetry and learning puppetry. So I did a puppet show for my for my master show and then um, started expanding out from there. Uh, moved to L.A. thinking I was going to get into more like Muppet-style puppetry. And then um, after a few years, dropped out of that and even took a break from puppetry. And then um, when by the time uh, I met Shoji, I was back into puppetry but doing more traditional forms and doing theater puppetry and, and learning a lot of other styles that weren't Muppet style. Mm. Well, it's interesting you bring up the Muppets because I think, um, you know, for, for people who, have, who may have been reading about Yamasong online, one of the names that's kind of been associated with uh, with the film is, is the Henson name. Can you, can you talk about how, how Heather Henson helped uh, make the short film and eventually the feature film a reality for you? Yeah, yeah. Um, Heather, I've known Heather for a number of years. I met her in San Francisco when I was going to art school, and we just kept in touch. And then when I moved to L.A., she was down here going to Cal Arts at the time, and we started, you know, talking. And and um, when Shoji and I started talking about doing a doing a, a project with puppets and his music, um, I was like, well, let me let me go to Heather. Maybe you know Heather might be interested in something like this. And so I went to her house. Uh, Fraggle Rock was playing on the TV, and I was waiting for her and watching Fraggle Rock and kind of thinking about this kind of neat, you know, this connection to Henson, Fraggle. I remember as a kid, you know, sneaking over to my friend's house because yeah. he had a show and I didn't. Yeah. And, you know, watching Fraggle Rock on his TV. So this is a moment, you know, one of those moments where, like, oh, there's this kind of overlap going on. And then <laughs> uh, he came in and we started talking, and I pitched it to her, and she didn't hesitate. She's like, that's cool. You know, I played the music for her, and I said, we wanted to. Uh, a puppet story around this. She's like, that's cool, let's do it. And so she funded the short film. And then after that, I became a, a, a part-time producer for her, I still am, for her Handmade Puppet Dreams project, which is funding a, a couple artists a year to make puppet short films. And then, um, and then you know, we got into, you know, last year when um, I was, I met uh, this, this man named Sultan Darmaki, who's from the United Arab Emirates. He was one of my Kickstarter backers for my last short film. And um, we were talking, and, uh, you know, he asked me if I had any feature projects, and I showed him the short film for Yamasong on my iPad, and he watched it, and he's like, this is beautiful. Let's make a feature. So, you know, <laughs> we went there. And, and then Heather's connection to this is that, you know, she's, she's showing her continuing support by uh, being the executive producer on this project. Uh, but this project is by and large through Dark Dunes, which is Sultan's company. Mm. I, I want to kind of get into the, to the how the the, the Yamasong short film kind of evolved into the feature length uh, Yamasong March of the Hollows that that'll be coming out next year. Uh, Shoji, you you know your your uh, involvement with the short film was kind of at at its inception. You know, it's your music that. Yeah. They kind of inspired Sam to, to write the original treatment and uh, the, where the original story ideas came from was just being inspired by your music. Now you're scoring a longer piece that, and as you, as you alluded to earlier, now instead of, instead of him kind of creating visuals around your music, you have to create music around the visuals. Can you talk a little bit about how that kind of a flip has, has worked and, and, and how you're approaching the score for the feature length version of the film as opposed to having the film yeah. kind of build around your music? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, the role uh, for me this time around is a lot different just because um, last time it was like I had already created the track and then there were, you know, uh, made some a couple edits to it um, to fit it into the short film, but mostly it was Sam just like taking inspiration from the music and building this whole sort of world around. And, um, and I think I, I really consider this like a, a conversation because I mean I feel like Sam has really sort of developed this really beautiful and fantastic world um, around Yamasong and like I you know I, I can't wait to have people see it like just like the the amount of like work and the craftsmanship that goes into each puppet is like it's really inspiring so um, so I get a lot of I feel like now it's like I'm constantly inspired by his visuals and, and ideas. Like every time I see a puppet, like I just hear music because <laughs> there's so, um, it's, it's, it's like, a, it's just a magical quality of like that sort of really handmade, like handcrafted um, artistry. And it just, 
you know, like I, I can look at any one of the puppets and once, especially once they start moving, you just, I just hear music um, mm -hmm. that, um, but you know, and that's the sort of inspiration point. I think from the more sort of technical point, like, you know, like the music is just going to be one element in the sort of overall telling of this, of this epic story now. Um, and so it's, it's a lot less about only the music, although, you know, the music will still be uh, an important part of the whole sure. sort of thing. But, yeah. um, but, you know, there's also the Foley, um, the original uh, Yama song didn't have any voice actors. It was, you know, the puppets were completely silent. So now there's, uh, you know, now there's uh, dialogue. So, you know, obviously those things, um, you know, it's, it's going to be, a, it's a, going to be about like really, finding the right spots for the music to shine and to sort of support, make sure the music is always supporting the, um, the world and the story that Sam's trying to, trying to tell. And I think, I think, um, but yeah, it's, it's really been a really great sort of conversation of, of inspiration back and forth. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a conversation and, you know, in the beginning before we had shot anything, um, I, I provided Shoji, I think it was three pieces of concept art or, or four or five pieces yeah. of concept art. And then, um, you know, you composed the first couple pieces off of that, and that was before we got to any visuals. So I was, you know, um, when when we were shooting those scenes, I was actually playing your music on set. So there's a little bit of that still, like, your music yeah. hopefully driving, you know, some of the inspiration, at least for the puppeteers and stuff. But we just did, uh, we just shot stuff in the in the temple where the, one of the, the terrapin, the tortoise warrior, was captured and he's going to be sacrificed. And so we were playing your temple music that whole nice. that whole session. It was it was pretty awesome. It's, uh, nice. Can't wait to hear it. It's 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 pretty cool. Well, I I want to I want to dive into that a little bit. You know, um, you know, Shoji talked about how the the, the original short film was was essentially a, a, I wouldn't say a silent film because the the music is definitely the front and center there. But uh, it, there it, there's been an evolution in terms of just scope and scale. I mean, going from an eight minute. Uh, short to like a, a feature like 90 to 90 minutes to two hour movie uh, is, yeah, a, is a big yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah it's a big leap uh, so can you talk a little about how you know how you approach just kind of building out the world building out the the story and 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 just for for folks who are listening and folks who are watching uh you're not you're not retelling the story from the short film this is a, this is a follow-up to the short film right right and, and it's, it's written in a way that, you know, through flashbacks, you know, someone who hasn't seen the short film will understand kind of the backstory. I mean, the eight minutes is really, uh, could almost be the intro, you know. Um, we set up the situation, there's an arc, and at the end of the arc, the two characters are separated from each other, and, and the, the tortoise warrior is back in his home world, and the, the uh, patchwork girl is back in the prison moon that circles the planet. So when the story opens, she's, we open with the prison moon. You see her looking through the bars, longing to go back to the world that she only got a, a sense of for that brief little visit. And she wonders about what happened to that tortoise warrior who showed me around. And then you go to the planet, and you find that he's in the mountains, and he's lost, and he's trying to get back down to the ocean where his, where his boat village is. And then he's attacked by the rivals who are these ram people. So anyway, to get back to your question uh, about building the world, um, yeah, going from eight to ninety minutes, I you know I knew that there had to be well just more content. But then the question was like, what is that? What's the content going to be? What's the story going to be? And I tried to tried to keep it centered around the two characters and that they were separated. And the one character in the moon wants to get back no matter what. She wants to go back to that beautiful world that she discovered. So that's her motivation in the first act of the story is to get back to the world. And the way she does it is pretty spectacular. Um, and then there's the, the tortoise warrior, and kind of his story becomes um, the, the ripple effects of having met the stranger from, this, uh, from the moon, you know. And, and uh, he comes from this kind of traditional uh, kind of mixed Asian culture. It's part Japanese, part Southeast Asian, you know. And, uh, but I, I, I kind of, when I was writing his, his people in the culture, I was thinking of, um, you know, Meiji or, or pre-Meiji era Japan before Japan was opened up to the West. And so there was like, you know, the, the rules or the laws where you didn't have contact with foreigners because the country was isolationist and it didn't want Western influence, you know, corrupting or tainting the traditional culture. So when he comes back to his village, there's, they see him and they know that he's changed because when he meets the girl, uh, they, they go through a transformation and he gets her eyes and she gets his. So when they see him, he's got this 
patchwork person's eyes, and they know he's broken the law. So he's kicked out of his clan and, and exiled. And so his story is about trying to trying to discover himself without a connection to his original clan, or asking himself, do I do I go off and start a new life, or do I try to find my way back into my clan? So um, building around those two characters, and then saying, okay, what other races are on this world? What are the other big stories? And kind of starting with big picture stuff, and then um, and then enhancing that with what each of the, the races in the world, how they, they deal with the question. And the big question for March of the Hollows is uh, the Hollows, who are the Patchwork Girls people, they're, they're mechanical people that have been imprisoned in the moon, um, they want to come back to the planet and take over the planet again because they believe that their gift that they impart is to turn, turn the organic creatures into mechanical creatures. And they think they're doing it as a, as a favor, helping the, the poor backwards creatures of the world by turning them into machines and, you know, in the process, making them slaves to the hollows. So, uh, but, you know, once, once I got started into that big picture stuff, then I started thinking, oh, this could, this could be 90 minutes. And you brought in a yeah, screenwriter then, as well to, to help, help. Can you talk a little bit about her involvement in the... In the... Yeah, Ekaterina Sadia, yeah, Ekaterina Sadia is a novelist. Um, she's probably most well-known for her novel... The Alchemy of Stone, which is a book that I read and um, kind of, you know, filed away. I read it as uh, Yamasong was playing the film festival circuit in 2010, and it has a story about a, a mechanical girl in this 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 kind of epic world that is a there's a struggle between alchemists and engineers. So you've got alchemy and 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 science kind of at odds in this world where the the person caught in the middle is the mechanical girl, and so. After I read her book, I was like, you know, I'd like to reach out to her at some point if I ever get a chance to do a longer form Yama song because I felt there was some creative overlap in, in what she was writing and, and what Yama song was about. And um, so then when when I had the chance to work on the film, I, I basically cold called her. I found her email address and sent her a message and sent her a link to the trailer. And she was like, well, this is beautiful. Uh, let me know if, if you need a, you know, a, a screenwriter. And so... You know, when I when I got the made the deal with Sultan, uh, then I reached out to Ekaterina and we started plotting out the the big story. Shoji, uh, going back to your process as far as the scoring the film, um, how much how much of how much of the uh, the visuals uh, informs your music, and how much of it is the the script and the story? I'm assuming that Sam shared the script with you when yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah I would say. Um... I don't know. That, that that that's a good question. I I think um, I think just because there's already this sort of shared vocabulary between uh, between Sam and myself, I I feel like we, you know, I like one of the things that really drew me to working with Sam is like when I heard his ideas and I saw his story treatments, I really felt like he was describing the same world that I was describing because mm -hmm. I, I was trying to do it through music, and he could do it through you know through puppets and through visuals. So I feel like there's already, like, without us even, like, having to say so, there's already, like, a, a mutual understanding of, like, what that kind of world is. Um, and as Sam has expanded it, um, I've taken similar steps to sort of expand the sort of uh, sonic palette of, of, um, of, the, of the music of that world. Be just because it's, it's a lot richer now, there's more sort of nuances. Um, it's a much bigger world with more characters and, and different races and motivations and um, and a much sort of a more epic storyline. So I think that all is, you know, coming in and, and influencing the music. But I think it's, you know, I, I really feel like it, it's coming from this place of, you know, of, of like when I'm making music, I, I think a lot of place and like, you know, texture and, and, and I try to be kind of specific about the mood or the the place that I'm making the music about. And I feel like, um, you know, I feel like, yeah, I just feel like, you know, Sam and I were, were both describing that same world. Right. And, um, and so it's, it's a very natural process in terms of um, thinking of other sounds that will work well within this world. Because I, I you know, I feel like we have this idea of, like, of, of what it is already. Um, yeah. And, and how much of it is being built off of Kind of like that original, that original CD that 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 ended up becoming the first Yamasong. And how much of it is is 
you like do, are there callbacks to that original soundtrack or are there um are i you, think there will be some uh there should be yeah there'll definitely be some uh some like references a lot of i mean a lot of the similar sort of things i'll be using like a lot of throat singing a lot of the taiko that sort of a uh, mix of electronic plus um uh you know live instrumentation is something i'm like always like working with um so there'll be a lot of those things and then even some of the sort of uh, structures of the original piece i think will be will be in there but um but it's all going to be kind of reworked and reimagined into right. this new yeah new yama song and Sam, that's kind of the approach you're taking with this feature, right? Like, like uh, Shoji, I like what he said about kind of like rethinking, reimagining that original world and kind of like building upon it. One of the ways that you guys have, have been able to do that is um, by having voice actors cast as, uh, as these characters, as, as was alluded to earlier, the original had no dialogue and now you have a full, a full cast. And it's not only a cast, it's a pretty spectacular cast of people. I know that um, well, like, uh, yeah. Yeah, you, the, the press that, that your film has gotten so far has, has kind of led with that. We haven't, we waited about 25 minutes before we even brought up the cast, but it's, it's, <laughs> it's pretty, it's a pretty impressive cast. So just, just for, for folks. Nerd who are familiar, heroes. It's, it's, it's very nerd friendly. It's very <laughs> sci-fi friendly. So, so for example, the, the cast consists of Nathan Fillion, uh, Whoopi Goldberg, George Takei, Peter Weller, Ed Asner, Frida uh, um, uh, Pinto. Um, who am I leaving out? I mean, Abigail that's a that, um, Abigail Breslin. Abigail David, Breslin. Yeah. Um, let me see. Did you get everybody? <laughs> Malcolm McDowell. Malcolm, Malcolm McDowell. McDowell. Yeah, how can you forget uh, Malcolm McDowell? How can you forget? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, that's a, that, that's a pretty impressive cast. Can you talk about what it's like working with them and, and just, uh, you know, you're. I'm, I know that you're. You're a you're fanboy yourself. You're. You're a nerd of color yourself. What What's it been like to? Uh, and I'm assuming you're a Trekkie because there's a lot of Star Trek. Uh, yeah, uh, Star, Star Trek, Trek alumni forever. in your in your film. What is their point working with them for? But uh, I, I think they they cut me off at some point. They're like, okay, enough enough Star Trek people. Uh, <laughs> well, it's, you know, it's just amazing to get to meet you know Malcolm Reynolds. You know, Nathan, <laughs> when he walked in the room, I was just like, oh yeah. my god. Brilliant, um, and it, it's really it was really amazing working with all of the voice talent that we got. Um, it would be great if we could have had them all in the room together and then meet all of them together in one place. You know, uh, I'm that's sure. for the that's for the premiere, right? There you go. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Uh, the voice the voice acting world is a very solitary kind of world. You know, where the actor yeah. comes in, sits in a booth, puts on their headphones and reads their line, performs their lines, and then you know signs some papers and leaves. Um, but the important that's, thing is you get to hang out with each of them. So yeah, that's right. Yeah, I get a couple hours with each one of them, which was pretty great. I mean, you know, Frida Pinto was very into performing her part. So mm. uh, when her character was jumping and leaping and attacking, she she asked the, asked the you know people at the studio to to bring in a, a desk or a table, and she climb on the table and jump off the table and nice. jump at the microphone. She hit it a few times. And, uh, <laughs> Her character falls down, you know, to get the grunts and stuff right. She wanted us to put the mic on the floor, and then she would fall on her side, you know, multiple times. I'm like, oh, I don't want to break Frida Pinto, but, <laughs> but she was getting pretty, pretty vigorous about that. And uh, yeah, each one has their own personality. You know, Peter Weller is a scholar, so he would, I, I bring the the character in for them to see this inspiration. And Peter Weller was looking at his character, who's who's brute, which is the is a, the ram, leader of the Ram people. And he's breaking it down in terms of, uh, like, the art, the artistic influences in terms in, uh, what was it, like, medieval, pre-Christian, Italian art history type lecture. And he just had us fascinated, you know, or, like, listening and listening. And finally, the, the people at the, the sound booth are like, oh, we need to record the session at some point. And it's like, oh, yeah, that's, all right, all right, sorry, Peter. Let's do the, let's do the show. And, uh, yeah, each one, it was, it was just amazing. You know, George Takei was really great to talk to because I could feel, you know, he was, he'd read, he, he read the script front and back. He knew all the stuff about his character. Um, I'd actually sent a slight modification to his sides the night before, and he didn't get it. So then he was, he was like, uh, what, what is, you know, he, he, he wanted me to explain everything because he had so thoroughly prepared yeah. everything else. And then, um, and then talking afterwards, you know, he, he saw, you know, my name, Sam Koji Hale, and he was asking me if, you know, I was Japanese-American, and so he was very curious about my background and, 
and then helping out, you know, helping out a, a you know, up and coming, you know, Asian American filmmaker. So it was really great to feel like, you know, Uncle George was in my corner. Well, I, I mean, I, again, I think a lot of folks are really excited for for uh, Yama Song when it comes out, um, and just everything you've been explaining as far as the the, the, the storylines and, and and the casting um, has, has been fantastic. One of the things that I think uh, that Yama Song kind of brings with it as well is just the idea of bringing back the, this kind of genre, the the uh, the puppet fantasy film and I think there haven't been there hasn't been one in a really really long time and you know the last I mean the last movie I can even think of with with puppets in it was was probably already like 10 years ago and that's I think uh, um, team team America is probably the last big film with, with that was that was fully puppet uh, can you talk a little bit about just the uh, the the notion of, of what makes what makes puppet films um, you know what? What what makes them good? Well, why 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 should we bring back that that format of filmmaking? Yeah, you know, I think more than anything, it's I don't think that it's it's a, a style of filmmaking that, that that went out of style. I think it's just that CGI has become such a, a central part of you know the the filmmaking and storytelling process that um, I think there's a it's it's really part of the culture of storytelling and filmmaking now. Is you know when you make a film, if it's a big you know, a big budget film is going to have a lot of CGI in it, and there's the pipeline is there for it. You know, mm -hmm. where making a film with all puppets and the post process that that's a pipeline that we're building right now. You know, um, we're bringing CGI into it too because I feel like puppets can live in a you know CGI enhanced world just like any other you know CGI enhanced world. You know, whether it's live action or animation. Um, but I think the you know the power to me with the puppets are. Um, there, there's, a, there's a couple things, but one is that it, it is a viable form of storytelling. It's a, a, an older traditional style. Um, so the, the challenge, I think, is being able to show that the puppets can convey emotion, that can convey, you know, ideas, and that they're, they're not just, um, you know, clunky, ugly things, you know. Um, I think we live in a, live in a culture where, uh, you know, when people see one bad puppet show, they think that's what puppets are. And I'm trying to show that you can create these incredible, beautiful puppets in an amazing world with a story and, and, and the, the full kind of breadth and depth that you could with live action actors or animation. Um, but yeah, it hasn't been done in a while, so I think that's part of the challenge and also part of the and and, and part of the um, challenge, both good and bad, I guess. You know, it's it's the challenge is to show people, hey, we can do this and uh, we can make something amazing and. And then hopefully that leads to, you know, creating greater and greater interest for these kinds of stories. Because you know, as a kid, I I love Dark Crystal, I love Labyrinth, I love the storyteller. You know, Jim Henson was doing amazing stuff. I think at the end of his career, and and um, I think that you know, if he if he lived longer, he probably would have been doing even more of this kind of stuff. And and now there's a you know more there are generations who grew up with that stuff that are I think familiar with the visual language and familiar with it, and and hopefully excited about it. Right. How about you, Shoji? What draws you to to, to puppet films and, and, yeah. and the idea of, of, of being a part of, of a film of a film that's trying to bring that bring and then, you know not, not bringing it back because as Sam said I mean it's it's a it's an art form that hasn't gone away but but at least bringing it back into like mainstream consciousness bringing it back into yeah. like that sci-fi fantasy world you yeah. know that definitely I mean I can speak much more just from a sort of fan perspective right. you know like I'm not of that sort of uh, that world like like as as deeply as Sam is but I definitely like as a fan of this kind of stuff like I feel like there's there's a like puppets have a real like magical quality and it's that that same like you know when you see when you see something that has been like so carefully handcrafted and you see the work of the hand you know in like a real way um there's just like and you know and then it moves like that's like it's so magical, you know, like, like there's a reason why, like you can go to almost every culture in the world and there's some tradition of puppetry, you know, and it, it varies throughout the world, but lots of the sort of most important stories that we tell as, as, uh, as a species, we use, you know, originally we use puppets to do so. And, um, like for me, it's the same thing as like, you know, when I, when I see like a, a model ship, you know, like, like, or when I see a, you know, a, like a model spaceship instead of a CGI spaceship, like, right. like, 
you know, like you, you can tell immediately that, oh, somebody made that, like some hand made that. And, and it's like, and you could, even though it's like shot to look like this massive spaceship, sure. you know, over a, a planet, you know that it's like this small, you know, you know it's small and it has that sort of quality to it. And I feel like, uh, especially Sam's puppets, they have that same, like, they, they create that same sort of magical feeling for me when I see them. Uh, just when I see them live or I see them on the screen, I just get that, like, like it touches this, like, really deep, like, childhood, like, childlike part of myself. Like, you know, that part that just is, like, instantly, like, drawn into this, like, magical and, and wondrous world. And and I think, um, you know, like, it's, it's, like, you know, it will take some getting used to for the audience. Like, um, some of the mm -hmm. sort of mouth, you know, like, they're, they're not as articulate as we're, used to our, our CGI, you know, sure. puppets being, but, um, but I think that's like, that's also another sort of great it's quality kind of the, it's about kind of them. The appeal. It's the appeal, yeah, right? It's, it's exactly. Why, why... It, it, it like, it, it leaves a little bit, like, there's so much of, of the filmmaking that, especially in the sort of fantasy and sci-fi world right now, it's like, you get to see everything, you know, like, and, yeah. and like, there's no space for your own imagination and your own sort of interpretation. And I feel mm -hmm. like art forms like puppetry, um, they leave more of that, you know, more of that space for, for you as a viewer to like, to, to sort of fill in, you know? And yeah, um, yeah. and I, I think like, I, I really felt that strongly when I saw Sam's, um, the underground show that, that when I first went to see it, like it was this um, really epic story about a father and son. It was an anti-war thing and um, like people, like they, you know, they draft him into war and like he, uh, he, the, like he, the father, um, the sort of like Fox trickster character comes along and like helps the family out. It's like this, this whole like thing. And it went on and it was like a good, you know, I can't remember how long, but I was totally lost. Mm -hmm. And then I left the show and it wasn't until like another hour that I realized that not a single word of dialogue was said in that entire okay. show. It was just like puppets, movement, and music, and like, like, because the story was so clear, and I heard the puppets' voices like very clearly in my head. But uh, and it, that was like a really, yeah, it's one of those like very profound artistic moments I've had in my life. I just thought like, wow, that was really magical. Like, I totally understood that story, and I, it, I was it made so you want. And it made you want yeah. to work with the guy, right? Yeah, no, exactly. And I feel like, um, you know, in this way, you know, they're, this puppets are going to have these really great voices and stuff, but those, it's still going to have that sort of, that core uh, quality that I think puppetry has the power to do, which is like this sort of, you know, really magical, uh, childlike wonder in, in, within yeah. the art form. I think the comparison between, like, CG and, and puppetry is really interesting because, you know, I mean, for all intents and purposes... You know, puppet puppetry is a kind of animation, even though it's not like hand drawn or computer generated. You are essentially bringing inanimate objects to life. Um, you know, if you had to kind of pigeonhole yourself, Sam, into one area or another, is puppetry live action or is it animation? Uh, you know, it's, that's a good question, and I would say I, I consider it. I, I would say I consider it more animation only because. Um, you are bringing something to life that isn't live. Uh, when I was when I when I sent Yamasong to film festivals, I applied to animation categories. Mm -hmm. So it's competing against animated pieces versus competing against live action, and that's because a recommendation that Lisa Henson gave me. Heather shared the the trailer with with her family, and then Lisa, the co-president of Henson Company, contacted me out of the blue, and we had a meeting, and we were talking about film festivals, and she recommended that. So. Um, and, and, you know, I'm, I'm going to Annecy um, International Film Festival, uh, Animation Festival, next week, and we're showing there for the first time a block of puppet films. Annecy's mm -hmm. always been very specific about has to be frame-by-frame -frame animation or they had all these rules, and so puppet films are generally rejected. But we, by invitation, were asked to bring films to show at this, you know, the, the grandfather of all the animation. Um, right. So that's pretty cool. Um so I'd say, yeah, animation more than live action, but it, we definitely shoot it like live action, you know. So we're, we're mixing animation techniques and uh, live action techniques in what we do. So it's, it's a hybrid, really. So can you talk a little bit about Sultan and how he uh, 
you know, because I think the most interesting thing about Sultan and and his his involvement in in the film and and kind of getting getting Marshall the Hollows made is that he was just a random guy who who essentially fund helped you fund a Kickstarter and and then you know that kind of speaks to the power of, of crowdfunding, right? Like you never know who you're going to meet and then you meet you meet a person who can essentially make you help you make a feature film. Yeah, it was you know when I talked to him about it, he. He was getting into Kickstarter at the time, and his morning routine was sit down, have a cup of coffee, hop on his laptop, and look at what the interesting Kickstarters are for the day, and and put some money into each one that caught his interest. And so when he saw my my uh, short film Monster of the Sky, he he took an interest in it right away because it had you know steampunk stuff, it had puppets as a fantasy thing, and um, and so he funded it, and then when he came to LA. He reached out and we met and started talking about puppet films. Ends up, he's he's a huge fan of practical effects. He, you know, he he loves monsters, he loves creatures, he loves puppets. All that stuff is like, uh, you know, 80s, early 90s. You know, Jim Henson, uh, Stan Winston, Rick Baker. You know, all those guys. You know, Amalgamated Dynamics. Those, all those people who are making at, uh, what you what you might call the golden age of the practical effects era. You know making creatures that are cable controlled or, or animatronics, all that kind of stuff he's a huge fan of. So, you know, he saw my stuff and then he started seeing some of my friends' projects and and then, uh, you know, he's, you know, really connected with with the um, practical effects community in L.A. And and um, I'm, I'm just lucky that I'm one of the, probably one of the first people or one of the early people that he started uh, funding in Kickstarter. And now he's created his own production company and he's doing bigger projects beyond short films on Kickstarter. Well, you're still guys, you guys are still in the middle of, of uh, shooting um, March of the Hollows. When, when do you conceive a uh, wrapping uh, production and uh, heading yep. into uh, post-production? And when, when will the film uh, see the light of day as far as a uh, wide release? Uh, so right now, yeah, we're, we're in the middle of shooting. Um, the, we shoot a week on and then a few weeks off. That gives us time to repair puppets and build, you know, build new puppets or set pieces or whatever. Um, but the plan is to be finished with shooting by the end of August and then be fully into post in September on. Um, we're already in post. We have a small post production team working on shots even right now, and um, you know, I'm, uh, you know, we're trying to keep kind of every stage of, of production moving as much as we can. And, um, you know, the, I think the challenge of post will be, you know, the green screen and cleaning up the green screen, getting rid of the rods, and then uh, bringing, bringing in the beautiful, beautiful environments around the characters. And uh, as far as when it's going to be released, I, I think it's going to be sometime in 2016. We don't have an exact date yet. We're, uh, my producers are talking to distributors, so it'll all depend on what kind of deal they get with the distributor. So um, stay tuned. I'm sure there'll be a, a big announcement when we, when we have that to announce. I, I, for one, am, am really looking forward to seeing the film, hopefully um, sooner than later. Uh, just, follow, oh, yeah, yeah. just following the evolution of Yamasong uh, over the last, I guess, five or six years, just from, from you know, being this short film, this passion project, and then eventually becoming this, this pretty big deal has been really exciting. Uh, good luck to you guys. Um, Shoji, can you can you give us a quick update on on Ensemble and what, how folks can find you guys online? Yeah, we uh, can find us online at ownensemble.org, which is just O N and then the word Ensemble E N S E M B L E dot org. Um, we have uh, three albums. Uh, we have some live music. Um, I am sitting on a whole stack of videos that I need to upload, which is supposed to have been done like two months ago, but <laughs> they're still on my hard drive. But but yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, well, hopefully we'll be on tour in a city near you. We're going to be going out to the Midwest in the fall, Chicago. Uh, we'll be out through the Denver area um, and at Minneapolis. So, anyway, oneensemble.org. So we'll find you guys online. And then, Sam, would you, any, anything else you'd like to plug but, but before? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, like our Facebook page. That's where you can probably, that's probably the best place to go to find out information about Yama song, especially updates, also behind the scenes photos, video. Um, we're 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 regularly posting stuff up there about the progress on Yama song. So uh, just look up, I think Yama song movie uh, on Facebook. It's it's public, so you don't have to you know right. you know, like it or whatever. But yeah, like it when you go there. <laughs> 
<laughs> and then and then uh, Dark Dunes Films. You can follow them on Twitter at Dark Dunes Films. Uh, I want to give a big thanks to my guests this evening, Sam Koji Hale and uh, Shoji Kameda, for for joining us and talking about Yama Song. Uh, hopefully, you guys. Uh, at home we'll be able to catch it soon and uh, I will see you next time well it's the NOC in full color you see me the hard knock life comics movies and TV yeah. pop culture with a different perspective watch it on your screen hit play so check this, this. is the hard knock life but not the chick of kind more like the people Seeking perspectives with a different line The kids who share their interests together with a similar kind When they said John Lover for Spider-Man, they didn't mind The activists, directors, comments and the lectures Fanboys, professional artists and professors Maybe a nerd who's just like you Talking about the things that you like too So I invite you to the end.